But today we come to 1 Timothy, at least by way of an introductory uh, lecture. And we want to make sure that what we sort of committed to at the beginning of the semester, we are still being faithful to at the end of semester. What we committed to in the texts that we tended to uh, more easily relate to, we stay committed to in the texts that we have a more difficult time relating to. So, so looking, and especially today, we'll be applying the historical and cultural and literary context of the statement in, in 1 Timothy 2 about teaching and exercising or assuming or usurping authority. Uh, we will see today specific language, uh, although we'll have to ask the question, is it intended also to be understood as exclusive? It's clearly specific, but is it also exclusive? Um, we will try to keep ourselves focused, as, as we have done throughout the semester, uh, on the explicit statements of the text, rather than looking for implications or inferences that might come up alongside of those statements. Uh, we will look clearly at the prescriptions and proscriptions of the language. And there are several that Paul gives in his letter to Timothy uh, at the church at Ephesus. And then we will seek as we fashion our statements, our conclusions, to use the language of Scripture as much as possible and not to read in contemporary terms or ideas that don't flow out of the text. So each of these principles will be especially applicable today. The work we've done so far, especially in some of the texts that have been a bit easier to deal with, I hope will prepare us uh, hermeneutically by way of learning how to interpret scripture, uh, it prepare us for what we do today. Because today is in many ways one of the most important texts in the debate. So uh, in order to keep our now not quite, but almost fully developed, theology of gender from the uh, scripture. Uh, I'm bringing us back specifically again to Paul's writings. Uh, I, I'm not in any way uh, excluding Genesis. Uh, in fact, we'll look at Genesis one last time in light of what Paul has to say in 1 Timothy. But to specifically understand his context, where he's coming from, and understand it chronologically, uh, from his earliest statements now to one of his latest statements with regard to gender. So, so his foundational statement, the status and function of those who are in Christ. Uh, we have come to this position by faith. We ought to live out in the way we live with one another, live out our faith uh, in the same way. So, so moving from an old covenant model to a new covenant community model uh, to remind us of what Paul has said so far about marriage because the terms for husband and wife will once again appear in the First Timothy 2 text. So the same question that we raised last week, is he talking about men and women in general in the church in 1 Corinthians 11? Or is he talking specifically about wives and husbands? So, so the wife dishonors her husband, the husband dishonors Christ, and a woman, a wife, should have authority over her head, and then how head was related perhaps to her husband. So the same terminology will appear in 1 Timothy 2, and so we want to keep in, married, keep in mind what Paul has said about marriage in the context, because the same Paul that's now talking about ministry this doesn't mean, I'll repeat it now one last time, it doesn't mean that you have to draw the same conclusion in drawing your own conclusions on the, on the gender uh, issue, the gender debate. You have to draw the same conclusions regarding the home as you do regarding the church. I have colleagues here at Talbot who are egalitarian on one side with regard to the church, for example, but complementarian with regard to the way they are at home. So, so some, some famous scholars like R.T. France uh, 
a uh, New Testament scholar takes that position. Uh, so it's possible, it's, it's sort of an option for you as you work out your own positions here toward the end. And then we recall what Paul had to say about headship or head, the head metaphor here with the body, one of sacrificial source of provision and sanctification, uh, Christ for the church, and, and the husband is called to be the head in a similar way sacrificing himself for his wife. Uh, and then we looked in the First Corinthians passage, whoops, Paul's one another theology also, but in the First Corinthians passage, uh, we looked uh, at the use of head there, a descriptive comment again, like it was in Ephesians, the husband is the wife, not should be, ought to be, or ought, ought to act in a certain way because he is, but the husband is the head. And the same thing here, the husband is the head, or a man is the head of a woman, uh, in the same way that God is the head of Christ, uh, and Christ is the head of man. Very different ways, but we talked about the idea of sequence in, in the point of origin or sending. Uh, and so we see here a point of origin uh, with regard to the woman and the man, and a counterbalancing one. So, as we came to 1 Corinthians 11 last week, what we did not find was a statement, a clear or direct statement with regard to the role that a man or woman should play in the context of church. Matter of fact, when we have finished looking at 1 Timothy 2, Today, we'll discover that the New Testament never speaks of roles that we play with regard to church or with regard to our, our homes. But specifically with regard to church, 1 Corinthians 11 told us only two things explicitly, that there ought to be some sort of, uh, using Gordon Fee's summary terms, uh, cultural gender markers or culturally sensitive gender markers, in this case, some kind of a head covering, perhaps being the same as or in addition to long hair, short hair distinctions. And the other prescription that we had is that the woman should, just like the man should not, and the woman should, and the woman should, and the men should not. So a woman should <clears throat> have authority over her head because of the angels. Whatever the last phrase means, uh, her having authority over her head seems to, I think reasonably clearly, seems to say that women should be responsible for how they look when they're ministering up front in the congregation. <coughs> and so it's not, it's not exclusive. Men also should be responsible for how they look, how they appear, how we appear when we're up front within a uh, gathering of God's people, an assembly that we call the church, and in, in here in a much less formal way. But Paul seems to have a particular emphasis on the women at Corinth, and perhaps because they, they needed to comment more at this time. Uh, sometimes in the marriage statements, he would comment more to the man or more to the woman, <clears throat> or in the Ephesians text, it was more to the man. So, same kind of thing here. It is a bit more to the woman. And it will be in the First Timothy 2 text that we come to today. And then one last passage <coughs> that we looked at after the break last time was the First Corinthians 14 passage which was mostly about speaking in tongues and prophesying. And Paul's concern was everything should be done decently and in order. And in that context, we have a statement. Some questions of whether or not it was original with Paul's letter or was added by a scribe. I personally think those are legitimate questions. I don't think we have a definitive answer to them yet. But because of the moving around it does in the text, because of the diacritical marks in certain manuscripts, 
it's at least a reasonable question to ask. But assuming it belongs, then we have a statement that, that is puzzling to us. Uh, it <clears throat> is telling women to be silent while in 1 Corinthians 11, they were allowed to pray and prophesy in the assembly. So everyone agrees that there's some kind of a qualified silence here. It seems that the best answer was that he's asking them, consistent with the text, to do everything in order. And so, so the women who were less educated should not be asking questions in the assembly at this time because it would be disruptive to what the prophet is saying. <clears throat> so they should kind of come up to speed, so to speak. Uh, but a difficult text, one that is not commonly referred to. Okay, with all of that as our background, uh, and not going to the first Peter text, but just looking at Pauline theology so far, we come to 1 Timothy 2, Learning with Quiet Respect is the title that I've chosen to give it. Uh, it comes toward the end of Paul's time of writing with regard to gender. Not, not the last thing he writes, but the last thing he writes regarding gender. <clears throat> so it forms a fitting capstone. And there's also a sense in which we sort of save the best wine for last uh, by way of a passage of significant interest to us. So I want to, uh, first of all, just, just to give a quick overview of the two positions. Uh, Douglas Moo wonderful New Testament scholar and one of the uh, contributors and actually uh, committee organizers with the latest New, uh, New International Version translation, the NIV 2011. <clears throat> so a complementarian who contributed as many other complementarians did along with egalitarians to that, uh, I think that very helpful translation. But Doug Moo, originally a contributor to uh, CBMW, no longer actually associated with the organization. He, I think he, he has become a bit concerned about the uh, rigid divide that has taken place, the entrenchment between the two camps, and, and so still complementarian, but tends to be more of a moderate complementarian, I think, at this point. But when he wrote in the book, um, he underscores the impact of church history for 20 centuries, the church has placed restriction on women because of this text. Now, now, what he doesn't say there is that we have had a widely varied history on what restrictions we place because of this text and how we go about doing that, <clears throat> as well as a widely, actually as a, a consistently patriarchal uh, position in church history where men were viewed as superior to women. So, so in citing church history, complementarians are, are actually forced to be a bit selective on the kind of things they cite from church history. But it is true, the, the uh, interpretation of the church in general has tended to see this passage as somehow restrictive. <clears throat> Moreover, he argues, there's nothing in the passage with a significant caveat as I have translated it. This passage and its import for the gender debate uh, is to some degree uh, at the very basic level about translation and how to translate a very enigmatic word, which happens to be the key word in the whole text. So <clears throat> as I've translated it, he says, there's nothing in the text that warrants limiting or not applying this text transculturally. Now, now actually, I would agree with him on this I, I firmly believe we should apply enduring principles from this text to our lives today in the church. Uh, it's not a question, as far as I would see it, it's not a question of whether or not we should apply this text or whether, as some would say, we should set it aside somehow. It's a question of how we interpret the text and then what principles we draw to apply in our lives today. So I, I think we're more together on that than, than his statement suggests. <clears throat> that is, in all times, all places, including today, this is consistent with the New Testament teaching on these matters elsewhere, and I think it is 
certainly consistent with the New Testament's teachings uh, elsewhere. But that begs the question of what the teachings are elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> so these are his, his summary statements. They are assuming, remember, RBMW came at, toward the, the beginning of the serious divide on the gender debate in the mid-1980s. <clears throat> so he's assuming a, a significant majority that would be in favor of what he's saying. And I think he, he might have worded it a little bit differently if he had worded it today. Uh, Linda Belleville, <clears throat> actually the two of them, New Testament scholars, and they work together in a variety of contexts. Uh, so good friends, but take different positions on this. Women at Ephesus were trying to gain an advantage over the men by teaching in a dictatorial fashion. That's where this comes in, as I have translated it. <clears throat> it's a matter of translating the term to either exercise authority, have authority, or to usurp authority. So, uh, Belleville suggests that this backdrop, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, is really the key to understanding the text and to discerning which principles should be applied and how they should be applied. Or I should say, what are the principles that should be applied? <clears throat> so she translates it a little differently. Let a woman learn in quiet and submissive fashion, not to teach so as to dominate a man instead of to teach or to exercise authority over a man. So at the very basic translational level. Okay, I want to bring us back to Acts 19. And as we've done throughout the semester, I encourage you to have a text open in front of you where you can look at context, <clears throat> especially as we focus in on very narrow issues within a text. But Acts 19, we're going to take a sort of a sweeping overview, introduce you to the backdrop for the city of Ephesus at this time and Paul's involvement with the city of Ephesus and with a certain Greek goddess named, uh, <clears throat> in the Roman context, later Diana, but in the Greek context, which uh, is reflected more here, uh, Artemis. So just condensed paraphrase, uh, verses 24 through 26, Demetrius, a silversmith who made shrines of Artemis, the Greek goddess of fertility, brought a lot of business for the workers at Ephesus. So this little seaside uh, village city uh, <clears throat> was the epicenter for the worship of the Greek goddess Artemis. And, and Demetrius, a worker within that, who was getting rich off of the local mythology. <clears throat> so Demetrius said, you know we receive a good income from this business. You can see where his motives lie. And you see how Paul has led many astray, has led astray large numbers here, and in practically all of Asia Minor, put on the map, we've looked at Ephesus before, so the area spreading out to the north, and especially the northeast from Ephesus, all of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, claiming that the gods <clears throat> made by human hands are no gods at all. So, so the rabbi Paul, and one of the images, one of two very different images of the Greek goddess Artemis. <clears throat> this one, and scholars do debate a little bit uh, about what these bumps are, <clears throat> but uh, the most common theory is she is the multi-breasted god. Uh, as a goddess who can bring life and fertility. Um, other interesting theories, but we'll let those go for now. But that's probably the most common. So, there is a danger, not only, Demetrius arguing still, that our trade will lose its good name, and, and meaning Shekelim, as, as Paul might say, uh, the money we'd get from it, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis would be discredited. And the goddess herself, who's worshiped throughout the province of Asia, Asia Minor implied, matter of fact, throughout the whole world, the great goddess would be robbed of her divine majesty. So the, the temple of Artemis, a reconstruction here, no longer standing, but deemed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
and the city of Ephesus, the center of the Artemis worship, the cult of Artemis in the ancient world. So the other image of Artemis that we see, quite different than the one we looked at a minute ago, this one, okay, but the other one we see is Artemis the Huntress. Uh, Artemis with the quiver on her back uh, and her bow <clears throat> and Bambi down here, uh, her little deer that she's protecting. She's not hunting the deer, okay? She's protecting the deer from men who hunt for sport. Oh, those evil creatures. Uh, and so she is drawing her arrow not to shoot the animal, but the man so that he won't kill the poor animals. So Artemis is the protector of the animals and the protector of women and the protector of children and the protector of women in childbirth in this context. And a goddess who doesn't particularly like men very much. So, <clears throat> carrying on. When they heard this, when the crowd that was listening to Demetrius make his little speech, heard this about Paul in his visit to Ephesus, uh, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I mean, she's our girl. She's our goddess. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. So the, 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 the mob is forming in the marketplace. <clears throat> and they seized Paul's companions, Gaius and Aristarchus, uh, I'm not quite sure how Paul figures into this. Uh, he's there, obviously, uh, but his companions are the one that sees, so he must be off the scene for a moment. And so his companions are drug into the theater, never a good place for Christians to be. And they all shouted in unison, not the companions now, but the whole city, who has gathered at the theater, hoping to see a little bloodletting, uh, for two hours. Great is Artemis of Ephesus. Great is Artemis of Ephesus. Try to imagine this for two hours. Great is Artemis of Ephesus. I've often thought about getting one of my classes just to sort of practice this for 10 minutes. Uh, but then I figured campus safety would show up in two, and so probably shouldn't do that. <clears throat> so in the context, in the context, there we go. The city clerk stands up. Don't ask me why. The city clerk of all people. But he stands up and says, people of Ephesus, shh, quiet down. Doesn't all the world know that this city is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? So, so the image we have of Artemis, whether it's this one or the multi-breasted image, was not actually created by a Demetrius in the beginning but the original copy fell from heaven to Ephesus, right there in the city. And the whole world knows that we're the center here. And the whole world knows she's a great goddess. So who are these guys? Not to worry about them. Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, calm down, don't do anything rash. And they, they calm down and he dismisses the assembly. When the uproar had ended, <clears throat> Paul sent for the disciples and encouraged them, saying goodbye, and he sets out for Macedonia. Just make a little check mark beside Macedonia for a minute as we come into chapter 20, verse 1 of Acts. This, this will play into the background for his writing to Timothy at this place, at the city of Ephesus. So, uh, just a uh, sort of flip side uh, look at the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, this is the original version. There's been many versions that have been published since the second century. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, second century BC, uh, I should clarify. But the Temple of Artemis stood from the sixth century BC to the second century AD, so it encompassed the time that Paul was there in all of its grandeur and its glory. Uh, but this is uh, Antipater, Antipater of Sidon, who says, I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon. This is Babylon the Great of Nebuchadnezzar's day, in which 
on which is a road for chariots. The legend has it they would do chariot races on top of the walls of Babylon because they were so broad. And the statue of Zeus by Alpheus and the hanging gardens back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, he gets two out of the seven. And the colossus of the sun and the huge labor of the high pyramids, the Cheops pyramid, 450 feet high uh, in Egypt, and the vast tomb of Mausolus. Ah, but when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. So, so pi picture how significant the cult of Artemis and the temple that represented that cult and her image which fell from heaven is as a background for reading Paul's letter to Ephesus, to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, as well as his letter to Timothy at Ephesus. So I said, lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. It sounds more Scottish than 2nd century BC, but we'll, we'll leave it as, as it is there. <clears throat> so, a couple things to summarize. The Artemis cult, world-renowned Ephesians temple with women as priests. A background for what Paul's going to be saying about the false teaching that goes on in Ephesus. Uh, that this wasn't the only show in town, but it was one of the most significant shows in town. <clears throat> it wasn't the only goddess cult in the Greco-Roman world. But from the testimony in the book of Acts, it's one of the most significant goddess cults, certainly in this context, in Ephesus. <clears throat> the Artemis cult believed that women uh, could be saved from men and through childbearing by the goddess Artemis. Um, she was born first, I should probably put up a slide here, the firstborn twin of Apollo. Uh, and when she was born, she came out first of the twins, and when she was born, she turned around and helped her mother deliver her twin brother. So Artemis came first, the woman, not the man. This plays a role in the statement that Paul made. And she's the mother of all limit, living. Uh, in the Artemis cult, they, they, they believe that the goddess was able to reproduce without the help of men. So men were, were, were not only uh, uh, the evil hunters of the field, but they were unnecessary for sustaining life. Uh, Artemis was the wise one who understood things. Men were the ones who were foolish and ignorant. Uh, <clears throat> she was neither created from a man, nor was she deceived. So she is the wise one. And Paul and Timothy and the Artemis mob are connected as, a, uh, as the specific historical backdrop and cultural backdrop to this letter. So uh, all we have standing of Artemis Temple today is this pillar, which you can see has been reconstructed, re-erected. Uh, on the site, so we have some idea where the temple would have stood. There's the theater up at the top of the hill where Paul's friends, Gaius and Aristarchus, would have been drugged. <clears throat> so put it into context here, here's, here's the Artemis temple, would have stood right here, uh, overlooking the, the beautiful bay area, and then the main part of the city spreading out on both sides, but the Artemis temple right here. So Paul and Timothy in, in, in Ephesus, for, for the Artemis riot, two companions almost killed, A.D. 54. Paul departs for Macedonia, and when he does, he leaves Timothy in Ephesus for the express purpose of opposing false teachers, teachers or false doctrines, which is specifically what he writes him about in 1 Timothy in the letter that we're looking at. So, Paul writes Timothy about Paul's teaching at Ephesus somewhere around A.D. 62 to 64, probably toward the end of that period. So, to put it into context now, so let's come to the letter itself against the backdrop, <clears throat> the biblical backdrop, 
uh, literary context, as well as the historical and cultural backdrop. So 1 Timothy 1 through 6, uh, these are chapters, numbers on the left, stop the false teaching at Ephesus. That, that's rule number one. Uh, in other words, cease and desist, and then we'll talk about why. Okay, then we'll talk about details. But, but until we can get this under control, stop, and stop now. That, that's an important issue as we'll come to chapter two. And then because of the false teaching, the complications that come from that, we'll look at more details. He says, therefore, in chapter two, verse one, which I believe is where we have to really start in our study, pray for authorities so that you may live peaceful and quiet lives. And then skipping down to verse eight, therefore, so therefore, therefore, going back to false teaching, therefore, the men and women should do certain things. And that's where we come to the gender specific instructions. <clears throat> chapter three, he goes to the character traits of good leadership. Chapter four, he comes back to the issue of false teaching and says in, in, in opposition, teach what is true, but back it up by godly living. Sounds something like Galatians. You, you've come to faith, now live by faith. Chapter five, treat the elderly and the widows with respect. And chapter six takes us back to chapter one, instead of false teaching, fight the good fight of faith. So, so putting your doctrine into practice. So the big picture of Ephesians and our chapter that we're going to look at more closely, chapter two, and specifically eight through the end of chapter two. Some scholars, and I think Mu does this, start at verse 11 and move forward. Uh, so just focusing on the statement about the women. Uh, if you start with verse eight, then you focus on all of the gender specific statements Paul makes so that you can keep it in context. And if you go back to verse one, you have the point of reference when he says, therefore, goes back to verses one through seven. So I think we have to keep the chapter together in this context. So a little summary again of chapter one. I, as I urged you, he's talking to Timothy, when I went into Macedonia, that, that's Acts 20 verse one, uh, I told you to stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain persons not to teach false doctrines any longer. So, so an ongoing practice of false teaching <clears throat> now, I'm not suggesting, to be clear up front, I'm not suggesting that the only false teaching in Ephesus was the Artemis cult. But neither am I willing to ignore the Artemis cult in the context of the false teaching at, at Ephesus. And I think both, both extremes can, can be dangerous here. And then Timothy, my son, his son in the faith in this context, most likely, I'm giving you this command so that you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and, and a good conscience, which some have rejected. So it's that fight the battle of false teaching, but live it out with your faith. <clears throat> so first section, and let's come to chapter two. Again, I encourage you to have this chapter open because we're going to kind of focus in on just some key phrases and even key words. So therefore, when you say, see a therefore, you're supposed to ask what? What is the therefore, therefore? Uh, and so it takes us back to chapter one and false teaching. So false teaching continues to be the issue uh, in chapter two. I urge, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for all those in authority. Uh, why? Why is he concerned about this? so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Is that it? Is that the, that the final objective that we have? No. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So let's pray for the authorities that we may have peaceful and quiet lives so that we can be a witness for other people to be saved. So his concern, as we saw in, in 1 Peter uh, 3, 1 Peter 2 and 3, 
is the same uh, with regard to having a, a Christian witness in a world that's hostile to us. And in this case, Paul remembers very well that hostility as his friends were almost killed in this context. Now, therefore, verse 8, let's come to the text specifically that concerns the gender issue. <clears throat> therefore, why? Because we want to live peaceful and quiet lives for the sake of opposing false teaching and being a good witness. Okay, for that reason, come here. I want the men and the women to do certain things. Uh, first, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Now, now how, many, how many of you uh, feel that you should take these passages uh, at face value, the way, way they seem to, what they seem to be saying? And how many of you, by way of biblical instruction, always lift your hands in prayer? Now think about it. Uh, or is that something that's just for men to do? Women shouldn't be doing that. I mean, it is gender specific in the context. Now why would he say just men if he meant for all men and women to do it? And if he meant for either men or men and women to do it, why do we so frequently ignore it in our context? Uh, there's some questions I want to ask with regard to consistency in the text. But it is, it is a command, <clears throat> a prescription, that is given in the context of a proscription, uh, without anger or disputing. So, so let me put it in a chart form with, with you know, smiley face and a not so smiley face. Uh, put it in a chart form, the men pray with, with uplifted hands, emphasis being on sincere prayer, instead of angry fighting, anger and disputing. So, so it is, the two come together in a compound statement, do this, instead of that. And we're going to see a pattern as we fill in these boxes, we're going to see a pattern throughout this chapter of doing this instead of that for the men and the women. Uh, and to be consistent with context, and, and I, I plead with you uh, as I have from the beginning, let context, context, context be the driving force in your principles of interpretation in the context, I think we have to keep these proscriptions and prescriptions together and look for the pattern that Paul is giving us here so that we can allow the immediate context, the verses that just preceded, to inform uh, the more difficult passages that we'll look at toward the end. So, okay, we'll come back to the chart. Uh, so then he turns to the women. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. And I can pause and look around again to see if any of you women are wearing gold jewelry, if your hair is not long enough. Uh, no, that, that this is talking about modesty, decency, propriety, a woman who professes godliness. So focus on the inner woman with good deeds that are appropriate for women who profess to worship God, not on the outward woman, just on the way, way you look. Uh, we, I think, in, in uh, Christian circles sometimes are still enamored with this whole issue of, of men should be courageous and women should be pretty, uh, something like that, some of a false dichotomy. Uh, but, but what Paul is calling for is the same thing Peter called for. For, for, for the wife to be a witness, even if her husband doesn't believe the word, to be a witness by that inner, inner quality. Uh, he's not saying that, that we should never have nice clothes, or I think we should never use uh, this particular metal, this particular pearl here, stone, as a, a decoration, uh, nor do we have to parse out in careful detail what elaborate hairstyles mean. But we look at the general principle, the enduring principle, that it's better to pray than to fight. 
It's better to have an inward beauty than an outward beauty, to focus on that. Proverbs 31 talks about that specifically. So once again, let's put it on the chart. We have do this instead of that. Dress modestly, decently, and properly, and do good to others. That's what's important. Avoid the, this sort of flaunting, to, to paraphrase it here, the flaunting of, of wealth and status and beauty. Now, <clears throat> this is gender specific, and, and it's a longer statement to the women than he made to the men. Maybe this was more of a concern than this was, or maybe he felt that just saying that much got the point across. More words are not necessarily better. <clears throat> but it is not, I would argue, it is not an exclusive statement. In other words, it's, think about it, it's a good thing for men to do good to others. There's no problem there, and to dress modestly and decently and properly. That may look a little different for us as men than it might be for you as women, but it, it, the principle remains the same. It's, it's the same principle we saw in 1 Corinthians 11 of dressing appropriately when you're up front in the assembly. And so, gender-specific, but not exclusive. Gender-specific, but not exclusive. Do this instead of that. He's not just laying down sort of universal principles of life, but he's addressing a specific issue that's going on at Ephesus. There was a problem with the men fighting, so he addresses it. There was a problem with the way the women were adorning themselves. So he addresses the problem, much like he did in 1 Corinthians uh, 7 uh, when, and 11 when he's responding to the letter that the people had sent him. Okay, uh, now to the passage. And as I said, I think this is where Doug Moose starts. It's where many complementarians start in reading the passage. I, I think we, we must, it is imperative, not just a little bit better or a good idea, but imperative to start with the beginning of the context where he moves from being a general witness to the world, refuting false teaching, a general witness for the sake of, uh, of the gospel going out, he moves from that to gender specific statements. So at the very least we have to start at, at verse 8 in, in doing any kind I think of a serious uh, article or teaching on this subject. So coming to now the third point, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission, I am not permitting a woman to teach in an assuming way over a man. She must be quiet. Now, unless I just want to plug Greek in on the screen, uh, I can't even read this statement aloud without some degree of interpretation. I mean, it's just, it's built into it. Uh, <clears throat> And so I'm using now the NIV 2011, which I think at least attempts impartiality on passages like this by bringing a team of scholars together that include egalitarians and complementarians. I respect that. A lot of other modern versions, especially some that, that seek to be very literal, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, do not do that. They're exclusively complementarian scholars especially with the English Standard Version. Uh, and I think that that's a disadvantage in, in doing a translation. You need a little more objectivity, especially when you come to a passage that you otherwise have strong feelings about. <clears throat> so I, I'm using this. I think it is a, a somewhat of a moderate middle way of translating the infinitive that is at issue here. So it could be uh, I'm not permitting a woman to teach so as to have authority, it could be I'm not permitting a woman to teach so as to usurp the authority, <clears throat> but somewhere in the middle, I'm not permitting a woman to teach so as to assume authority, uh, sort of somewhat of a gentle middle. So we'll leave it there for now, uh, and then we'll come back to the details of it. But she should learn in quietness, full submission, be quiet, like 1 Corinthians 14. Remain silent. Don't speak. Same kind of language. Okay, let's come back for just a second to Luke 10. <clears throat> and the story we looked at quite a while ago, it seems now, of Mary of Bethany, who came and sat at the Lord's feet 
listening to what he said. Not, not coming in so as to teach or to usurp the authority of the disciples or something like that, but simply sitting at Jesus' feet and listening. And Jesus commends her for this. Few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So I, I say this to underscore, <clears throat> um, maybe I should say to indicate my full submission to the authority of this text uh, and say that the prescription is to learn in quiet submission. I think that's a good thing. It certainly was a good thing for the women at Ephesus. Uh, I think there was a, a reason Paul singled them out in this statement. But it's not something that's exclusive just for women. Uh, I have students that come into my classes sometimes just for the sheer purpose of arguing with me for a whole semester. That, that can be somewhat frustrating at times. Uh, I'm often tempted to argue back with them for the whole semester, but then that's frustrating to the whole class. Uh, but, but we should come into a context of learning for the sake of learning, of listening. Uh, and, and of course, ask hard questions, share opinions, but for the sake of listening. And I think that's what Paul's calling the women to do. It is similar to what we saw <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 14 where he said that this has to be done decently and in order. And even though there were some very well-educated women, Jewish and Roman, uh, at this time, the majority of Jewish women, and I would argue of Roman women, were not that well-educated compared to the men in their lives. Uh, and so he's saying you need to learn coming into the context. Uh, if you put this in the context of a of a city that had a pagan goddess cult <clears throat> where women were seen as superior, as having the truth, and men as inferior, uh, of being foolish and deceived, then it is especially important to tell new converts coming into the church, especially the women of Ephesus, uh, that they need to learn in quiet submission to the existing leadership of the church. That so, so, so no, that there's, there's no contention over this statement. Uh, it, it's one that at least we ought to be in full agreement on. Now, one thing I haven't pointed out yet, and I should use these images to do so here, is that <clears throat> you have two different groups of women in the, both the Jewish and the Greco-Roman pagan context, especially in the Greco-Roman context, but it, it also, I think, applies to Hellenistic uh, Jews at this time. You have the average woman, the, the, the folk, as they say in German, the, the average women who were not very well educated at all, were women uh, not of a very high status or means. Uh, and, and then you have the aristocratic women on the right side, <clears throat> those who had uh, special access and privilege to education, to power, to wealth, to status even though it might be relative to the power that their husbands would have had. In some cases, there are very powerful women who play a role in, in the politics of the ancient world. Uh, sometimes it's subordinate to that of her husband, sometimes not, but it was certainly superior to many in the society. So when Paul talks about women not adorning themselves with all the status and wealth, the outward beauty, he's probably thinking of these women. Uh, women who had a special status in town. Uh, and I think it's, it's not too much to consider the possibility that he's thinking of women who may have also been involved in the Artemis cult, uh, adding to the status and power and perhaps wealth. Think of Demetrius with his little trade, uh, the wealth that they may have had uh, available to them. So uh, back a click here. I'm not permitting a woman to teach in an assuming way over a man. Let's come to the actual language of this. First of all, <clears throat> the, the term that I alluded to before, uh, in the infinitive, it's alphantain, uh, alphanteo in the basic verbal form. Uh, and its meaning is unclear. I don't say that as, as an egalitarian as opposed to a complementarian. I think it is empirically verifiable. Its meaning is unclear in, in Paul's usage of it in this letter. 
Uh, it, it has been a point of debate since the King James Version, even before that, but in the early King James Version, uh, it was read one way for a while and then it switched to another way. So it is a hapax legomenon. It is a lone occurrence of this term in the New Testament. So, so we can't say, well, let's look how Paul used this elsewhere. When, when he said something about uh, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body, or the, the prophetess should have authority over her head. Uh, no, in those cases, we talked last week, it was exousia. And, and that clearly means power or authority. But, but this term is a different deal altogether. It has a broad semantic range. It's been the subject of debate almost as much as this whole passage has. <clears throat> On a negative side, and that is the negative connotation, it can mean to dominate, Linda Belleville's argument in DBE, uh, to assume authority, the NIV uh, interpretation, to usurp authority in, in a more aggressive way. We, we've come in to topple the government here, to topple the eldership of the church. Or even, and, and actually our provost, David Nystrom, made this comment the other day, uh, in, in several places in Greek writings, it carries the connotation of violence. Uh, Ed Wilshire, formerly professor in our history department, did a, uh, a lengthy uh, article on this, uh, in which he examined, sort of like Wayne Grudem examined all the occurrences of kephale in Greek literature. Well, Ed examined all the occurrences of Athenteo in the Greek literature surrounding Paul's time. Uh, and he saw in some cases the term actually means to kill someone. That kind of violence. To, to the ultimate usurping of authority over another person. So it could have that strong negative meaning, and that seems to be the meaning it has up until the time of Paul. So in the 200 years of literature that precedes Paul. Now, from the time of Paul on, or I should say after Paul, because we're begging the question of what Paul meant by this, but after the time of Paul, in the early church writings, we find, primarily connected with this passage, Althantain being taken to mean to exercise authority, or to have authority. And again, I reference you back to the lecture by the McCurlins on does authority really matter? And, and what is authority? And where do we have our source of authority? So, but, but that on the side of it, uh, this is the question of the basic meaning of the term. Is it a negative term? Something that's bad to do? Not just for women, but for anybody. Or is it a positive term? Something that is prohibited for women, but entirely encouraged for men. And, and so, my, my leaning on this has been to say, well, if Paul is using the term in a way that he expects his readers to understand it, it is more likely he's referring to literature that's written before him than literature that's written after him. E even if the, the more neutral meaning or positive meaning of the term were emerging at his time, the, the long-standing, we should say, the long-standing meaning of the term is most likely negative. To usurp or to assume authority, come in through the congregation as someone who needs to learn, but you come in with an assuming attitude like you know uh, so much that everyone else needs to learn and you're going to be the teacher. Uh, so, so you are implicitly usurping the authority of the leadership. Now one other thing to add to the complexity of the argument, and then we're going to try to iron it out into a, an answer, hopefully a little bit more coherent of an answer than we are able to give for the 1 Corinthians 11 passage, but it's entirely possible that the phrase that we have here, neither to teach nor to authentain, okay, just leave it Genetic, uh, generic here, uh, to dominate, maybe you assume authority, uh, is a hendiatus, uh, meaning, in Greek here, two infinitives with one compound meaning. And now this suggestion is not particularly egalitarian nor complementarian. Uh, 
Uh, matter of fact, my, my uh, colleague and longtime mentor, Bob Sosi over at Talbot, would agree with me, or I agree with him, whichever way you want to go, that this is a hendiatus, that, that it means either you, you should neither do this nor that. In other words, linking them together in a compound thought, or even more so, you should not do this in that way. So in other words, you should not teach so as to exercise authority, assume authority, usurp authority, that somehow the nature of the teaching is further defined by the term alphantine. Now, now from our perspective, that seems odd because we're thinking, I know what teaching means. Didasco, the word teach, is not a difficult term to figure out in this text. But I don't know what alphantine means. So why would Paul use a less clear word to explain a, a word, a term that's, that's more clear? Uh, and I think the answer is, at, at the time Paul's writing, this was not unclear in its meaning. It's unclear to us because of a tradition of reading this passage that arose, I believe, after the time of Paul, after he wrote the passage. Uh, but in his context, I think he would have, uh, he would have assumed that the people uh, understood what it mean, meant. But okay, let's come to, uh, again, we'll flip over to another text in Matthew to talk for a second about teaching <clears throat> and the nature of teaching. This, is, this links very closely to the McCurlin's uh, uh, presentation on authority. The, the ideas are, are closely connected. Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, you are not to be called rabbi. Literally, it's a Hebrew word, rav, to mean great, or many. So, great one, a rabbi. For you have only one teacher. So, using a synonym here now, didaskalos, it's the same as the infinitive didaskain in the Timothy passage, to teach. You, know, you have only one teacher. So, so, the rabbi was a great teacher. The rabbi was a respected and honored teacher, spoke with authority in the Jewish culture. And Jesus says, don't go there. <clears throat> you have only one teacher, and, and you are all brothers. He's speaking to a male group. Okay, so appropriate reference to brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, the pater, patera, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called leader a guide or instructor, for you have one leader, capital L, the Messiah, the Christ, and the greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, a very important principle, I think, to keep in, the, in our minds with regard to 1 Timothy 2, uh, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying that we're not allowed to speak to our earthly father as a father. I think he's speaking in the context of instruction and church community, or at least what will be the church community as the church develops after Pentecost. <clears throat> but he's saying, remember in all of this that the real authority is God. And that even your teachers are merely guides, fellow instructors that come along beside you. Uh, this passage, if I can put an aside here, this passage challenges me significantly with regard to my own role as a teacher, uh, along with the passage that says teachers incur a stricter judgment, which always, I mean, I just assumed that one wasn't there in James, but it is. Uh, I don't like stricter judgments. <clears throat> but I think it challenges us to, to keep in mind that the ultimate teacher in the class is the Holy Spirit, the ultimate authority in our lives is God through the Word of God, the Spirit of God through the Word of God. So. What does it mean to teach in the context of Jesus' day with the rabbis, as they were? Uh, <clears throat> teaching carried the idea of being a significant authority. Now, Jesus contradicts that. He says, no, it's not the way it ought to be in Christ. But it was the, it was the context in, in which they spoke. So I'm not permitting a woman to teach. And, and I think it's a hendiatus in a way that assumes authority over a man. So, so put the context in. Women in the Artemis cult taught in a domineering manner over men. That, that, that again, is just empirical knowledge. It's, 
There, there's a good bit of primary source literature in the Artemis cult. Matter of fact, there's an interesting little paperback that I meant to bring you uh, on the Artemis cult, uh, written by an Artemis worshiper of the contemporary period, in which she cites a variety of sources uh, with regard to the sort of domineering teaching of the priests, priestesses, priests in the Artemis cult, uh, which were pre predominantly women, domineering over men. That was the issue at hand in the cult. So new converts to Christ from among the Ephesians, where this cult was so prevalent, would have assumed this long-standing privilege. I mean, I'm a woman, therefore, I come with a certain degree of, of superior knowledge and understanding than a mere man would have. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a true feminist cult of the day, in the sense that, that women were, were elevated, seen as superior over men. So put it on the chart again, learn with quiet respect instead of teaching in an assuming way. Now, is it gender specific? Of course it is. Is it gender exclusive? That's where the question comes in. And that, that's the very heart of the question, I think, in this text. Uh, it, because it says, I don't want a woman to teach over a man, does that mean, here comes the inference or implication, does that mean that it's just fine, matter of fact, it's a good thing for men to teach in an, an authentic way over women? Well, that's not what this text says. It says, I don't want the women to teach over the men. And I think Paul is speaking specifically, yes, of an enduring principle, but in a specific context. And, and so coming into, let, let me put it into a very uh, practical context uh, in regarding the modern gender debate. Uh, a, a woman finding a sense of a newfound freedom in Christ. And, and always being told, I, I, I talked to a, a, a new pastor at our church, missions pastor, who's a Fuller graduate. And so I, I said, hey, I'm a fellow Fuller graduate. We can you know, welcome to the church, chat about it. And, and she was telling me about her church background before she went to seminary, where, where she was very strictly told that what she ought to do with her life is to learn how to cook and sew and take care of a home and take care of children and find a good man to take care of her. And that that should be her goal in life, that going to seminary was a waste of her time. So, so, so she, she comes now, her name's Amy, We'll just use her as an example. She comes now to this newfound freedom in Christ. It can be tempting in that context to come into a church and say, hey, we need more women in this context, and I'm going to push myself into a leadership position so that I can get a woman's voice into this, a, 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 an assuming or domineering way in which you teach. Uh, and so I think the principle comes across, and it's not only for women, but also for men. If a, a man becomes a convert in Christ, comes into a church, learning in quiet submission is a good thing. Respecting the existing leadership in a church, it's a good thing. We ought to be doing that. We, we should never be, men should never be, teaching in an authentic way. In a way as to, so how's that? exercise authority over other people. I think Jesus would say, no, 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 no. It's the way of the Gentiles. The Gentiles lord it over each other, but you are called to a different lifestyle, that, that one of humbling yourselves, not exalting yourselves. So I think his passage speaks specifically to that principle. And in that sense, it's very transcultural, and it applies today as much as it ever did. But, but the issue is not about excluding women and including men, it's about all of us, especially in this context, the women, to learn with respect instead of teaching to assume authority. Now, the last part of this, and this sometimes is pointed to as the reason that you must come to a complementarian conclusion on this passage, because it refers to the Genesis account. So, so Paul doesn't go to culture, he goes to scripture, is the way it's usually stated. So let's take a look at this. 
Uh, <clears throat> last time we talked briefly about the uh, use of gar, the Greek gar, for example, or because. Uh, and we talked about how it can carry the idea of, for example, I think that's what Paul is doing here. Adam was formed first, and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. The woman was deceived and became a sinner. Now, I'm pulling some material here from our former provost, not our present one, but a former one who's now, I think he's now close to retirement, but he has been over at Fuller more recently, uh, Sherwood Lingenfelter. His wife, Judith Langenfelter, uh, also a professor here at Biola in, in the past. Uh, a little essay that he did back in the 80s, Formal Logic versus Practical Logic, which should form the basis for cross-cultural theology. And he used 1 Timothy as an example that suggested that what Paul was doing is using the example of Eve and Adam, especially Eve, for the women at Ephesus to humble their pride and arrogance, that flaunting of wealth, status, and beauty, the pride and arrogance already alluded to in the passage. So the Artemis cult taught that Artemis was formed first, and then Apollo came along. And so there was a superiority because she came first. And Paul's saying, actually, Adam came first, and then Eve came first. So we have our own stories to tell. Uh, and so, no, no, was, and, and the Artemis cult believed that men were deceived and that women had superior knowledge. And Paul's saying, no, actually, it was Eve that was deceived and not Adam. Matter of fact, she was super deceived, the text says. Adam wasn't deceived at all. Now, now what, do, what do you think of when you first read this? Uh, <clears throat> again, I remember Dr. Tonis' comment about what the passage seems to be saying. Uh, when, when you first read this passage at face value, okay, before studying it at all, first time across, what does it seem to be saying? Women cannot teach over men because Eve was deceived and Adam was not. I mean, doesn't it sound like women are more deceived than men? That's exactly what I thought when I read this passage. I, I still remember... Uh, uh, Tim Bailey from the CBMW president at that time coming to a chapel uh, here at Talbot and saying, remember how this passage first came across to you when you first read it, that's what it means. And just left it unqualified like that. And I thought, oh my goodness, I remember what I first thought when I read this passage. Uh, and, and that, you know, foolish women, uh, no, no wonder the church is going to be in trouble. Uh, but, but no, I don't think he is saying that. Matter of fact, let me bring us to, uh, first of all, the, just by way of, uh, uh, of remembrance here, the way hati, because, runs different than gar, for example, and we're using gar in this context. So we looked at this last time. I don't need to leave it up on the screen. But think of what you were. Consider the sequence with Adam and Eve. Consider the deception of Eve. In other words, women are not superior. That woman was deceived, and the man wasn't. Doesn't make Adam sin less because he knew better and decided to sin anyhow. I mean, the foolishness of some of the theologies that can crop out of this if we don't pause and think carefully about what the text is really saying. Uh, but put it in the context. Practical logic, two examples intended to humble the proud women at Ephesus. So, Eve is second. Artemis Cole says, no, women are first and superior. Eve is deceived. Artemis Cole says, no, 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 no. Women are not deceived. Men are deceived. And Paul is saying, actually, that, that woman was deceived. So it's a, it's a humbling effect, a practical logic, uh, as Lingenfelder uh, puts it. Uh, <clears throat> Eve is sometimes used as an example for men being deceived. So, so it's not just, in this case, Paul used it one way. In another case, back in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians this time, I promised you to one husband, that is to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds, O oh Corinthians now, the, 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 the church, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. 
So, so Eve can be an example of women being deceived at Ephesus, uh, or an example at Corinth about all of us being deceived if we stray from our pure devotion to Christ. Uh, so an example in the context. And then finally, uh, and perhaps the most enigmatic passage, uh, recently in the journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, a professor at Talbot Moyer Hubbard uh, did an excellent article on this verse, just the verse, uh, because of its great controversy, not just for gender debate, but also just in general. Uh, yet, women will be delivered through childbearing, or sometimes that's translated, saved by childbearing. And I remember what I first thought when I read that, too. Uh, so a woman who doesn't have children isn't saved, okay? Uh, or, or, or maybe it's talking about the Messiah, that, the, that a woman had the child. Not what the text says, but there are some who interpret it that way. Or, or maybe it means delivered in the sense of the Old Testament sort of rescued and kept safe. That kind of delivered or saved through childbearing. <clears throat> it's conditional. If they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety, back to the putting on the good deeds instead of the fancy clothes. So Paul balances his rebuke of the proud women. You know, remember Eve was deceived. Remember Adam was created first. Learn quietly, please. You know, instead of coming in here thinking you know everything and want to usurp the leadership. So a strong rebuke to the women of Ephesus, but then he balances it out with a statement of hope, which is, a, I think, a rather beautiful part of this passage. He counters the judgment that follows. So Eve's fall from grace in Genesis 3. Uh, remember the first thing that's said in the judgment of all places is that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So, so while Eve was in the Genesis account, first in the fall, uh, although I think when Arlen was here a few weeks ago, he, he suggested that maybe Adam was first in the fall because he showed her where the tree was. Uh, well, the text doesn't tell us that, so I'll let the text speak for Eve going first and then handing the pomegranate to her husband, uh, Adam, who was with her along the way. Uh, so she's first in the fall in the, in the literary structure of the text, but she's also first in redemption. Uh, matter of fact, the only one in redemption, uh, as the seed of the woman crushes the head of the serpent. So she forms two different things. In this case, I think a statement of hope. Uh, so women delivered. The Artemis cult promised to do the same thing. Women, Artemis can keep you safe, just like she did her brother Apollo. She can keep you safe through childbearing. This was a, a, a frightening, threatening thing. For, for women pre-modern medicine, and even in the context of modern medicine, not something that you take lightly. Having children, if my wife Pat were here, she would remind me of that. You know, she, I think she told me I could have the next one. You know, two were enough. <laughs> uh, 23 hours of labor for our firstborn Debbie. Uh, yeah, and I said, I was with you all the way, and she said, sort of. Uh, <clears throat> sitting there watching and saying, hang in there, sweetheart. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, but uh, no, does it mean that if women trust Christ, that they'll always come safely through childbearing? No, no, it's like a proverbial statement. There, there is a principle here. Uh, but we ought not, I was going to say, we ought not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's a bad mixing of metaphors here and puns. Uh, but in this context, it is Christ who can keep you safe through childbearing. So, but, but not just because Paul happened to be thinking at that moment about having children. Uh, no, this comes for two reasons. One, because the Artemis cult, uh, this was a, an important principle within the teaching of the, of the Artemis cult, or, where Artemis kept women safe through childbearing. But the other issue is, it's the other part of the judgment. Remember, this, this, this male dominance, uh, your husband will rule you, and you will have multiplied painful toil, suffering, and childbearing, were the two parts of the judgment that the woman faced. And so if he's talking to her, 
about an issue of domination where this feminist cult, the women want to dominate the men, uh, and if he's, he's rebuking them on that, no, you learn with quiet, in quiet submission from these men. Uh, he also brings a statement of hope with regard to the other part of the judgment. So I think that the two come together in, in a balancing way. So let's complete the chart then. Uh, positive principles, pray with holy hands, dress modestly, learn in quiet submission, keep hope alive, practice faith, love, and uh, holiness. On the negative side, do that instead of this. On the negative side, stop the angry fighting. Uh, don't go around flaunting your status and wealth and power, beauty. Don't teach in an assuming way. And let Eve's example humble you. Now, the, the text is primarily focused on the women at Ephesus, not the men. But, but the men are also addressed. The passage in each case, all four statements, addresses a positive in place of a negative issue. Each case, they are gender specific. But in, in the other three cases, at least, they are not gender exclusive. And so, especially in this context, I don't think we should read this in a gender-exclusive way. This could apply across gender. This could apply across gender, and should apply. Uh, and so, why not this? Don't teach in an assuming way. Uh, stay with the language of the text. It says, I am not permitting, present act of indicative participle, I am not now permitting a woman to teach over a man. I've called a moratorium on that. I think Paul does that because of the circumstances he's uh, addressing. Uh, but don't assume by him saying a woman shouldn't do this, that a man should do this. Should a woman engage in angry fighting? Should men flaunt their wealth, status, and beauty? Uh, not, no. So, so we don't assume it there. We don't assume that. Why, why do we assume it here? I, I think it's, assumptions get us in trouble. So enduring principles underscore enduring principles, okay? No egalitarians, don't throw those away. Uh, we do have to deal with those in the text if we're committed to the text as our authority, and we happily do so. So truth, instead of false teaching, major issue here. Prayer, instead of angry debates, as Ed Curtis would say, we have plenty here on our plates to say grace over. Good deeds, decency, piety, instead of flaunting status and wealth. Quiet, respectful learning instead of teaching so as to assume authority. Add them up. Gender-specific language is sometimes appropriate, sometimes even important. Some, sometimes there's an issue going on with the men or the women in a given context where a pastor or a teacher ought to address them specifically. I, I don't think that he or she needs to address them privately all the time. I, I'm not one for, you know, getting the men and women separated so we can talk about important things. Uh, but, but rather, sometimes it's appropriate to address one group or the other, and not just gender-related groups. A humbling rebuke should be balanced with possibilities of hope. Uh, at least that's what I see Paul doing in this context, and it seems that it's a good thing to do. General prescriptions for church leaders. This is, this is what we do have in the scripture. Involve godliness, giftedness, experience, and, and I think experience, I left education unhighlighted because not in the modern sense of they need an MDiv to teach in Paul's day, Master of Divinity or something. But at least these three, and maybe education kind of coming in the context uh, of the ancient world in a more informal way. And newfound freedom in Christ should be exercised with respect to existing leadership in one's church. I, I came 15 years ago to the church that Pat and I are attending now. We came 15 years ago. I came knowing that the church was a bit more egalitarian than the one I, I left, uh, but also knowing that it wasn't fully egalitarian. So I could have come in with kind of a, a, a crusader's mantle uh, and started to teach so as to usurp the existing authority of the church. It, it would apply to me as well, not just to women. Uh, but instead, I, I have sought to 
to have an influence, to, again, to use McCurlin's language here, to have an influence in the context, but not to usurp or assume or even exercise authority. Uh, I, I think it goes beyond what we're called to do in Christ. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.